there are many things us pilots have to know about the airplanes we fly. An important source of information is the Pilot Operating Handbook and Airplane Flight Manual, the POH and AFM, and you need to be familiar with that. And within the AFM, there's a section called Limitations, which has a somewhat special status. Now, what do I mean by special? Well, if you look at the regulations, you'll see that Part 91 that's the one with the general operating and flight rules, requires the AFM to be available in the aircraft when it's operated, and it requires that pilots comply with the limitations section of the AFM and with markings and placards. Interestingly, it doesn't say you have to comply with anything else in the book. It just talks about limitations. And part 23, that's the one which defines the aircraft certification rules, says that an AFM must be delivered with each airplane and it highlights the airplane operating limitations as the one section that must be approved by the FAA. Meaning that the aircraft designer can write the whole AFM somewhat freely but must get FAA approval for the limitations section. So yes, limitations are special. Man's got to know his limitations. Now, Let's take a look at what we find in this limitation section. Let's look at something simple like the limitations of a Cessna 172. It starts with some very basic things like airspeed limits and power plant limits. Instrument markings are also part of this. So if your airspeed indicator or oil temperature gauge don't have the specific markings listed here, that's a problem. In the case of the 172, some of the restrictions depend on whether you are declaring to fly in the normal category or the utility category. You have to be lighter and within stricter CG limits to fly in the utility category, but when you do, some other limitations are relaxed. For example, spins are now approved. The kinds of operations limits is very simple in the 172, basically referring to the applicable FARs. Let's look at the equivalent section for a Cirrus SR20 instead. This table is part of the decision-making process when something is broken, to see if it's still okay to fly. For example, in the SR20, your battery number one is required for any flight. But if battery number two is broken, you can legally fly a VFR, but not IFR. And I'm not saying it's always a good idea to fly a VFR with one battery out, but you have that option, if you think it's prudent and safe for a given flight. You can also see here limitations related to the autopilot. For example, different maximum airspeeds depending on whether your SR20 has an STEC 55 or 55SR autopilot. But what if yours was retrofitted with a different autopilot, like the Avidyne DFC90, which many service owners have upgraded to, or a modern Garmin autopilot? This brings us to a different topic, the AFM supplement. What's an AFM supplement? It's an add-on to the AFM that came with the airplane to add, remove, or change information that is affected by the addition of an aftermarket product, like a GPS or a new transponder, or something entirely different like a bigger engine than the one the aircraft was first made with, or ice protection or air conditioning, or additional fuel tanks. Any of those come with instructions on how to use them, often amending some of the information in the original AFM. That is what's called an AFM supplement, or short, AFMS. And a good way to think about it is that the supplement becomes an official part of your airplane's AFM. You must have it on board when you fly, and, back to the main topic, you must comply with the limitations listed in the AFM supplement. And these can be more or less stringent than the original limitations. For example, Adding ice protection may relax the restriction which prohibits flight into known icing. Let's look at some examples. Here's one for the Garmin GTX 345, a transponder with ADS-B in and out. The limitation says that you cannot use data link weather for maneuvering in hazardous weather. Probably not a big surprise. Here's a more interesting one for GPS. It's the AFMS for the Avidyne IFD in my Bonanza. I can see here that I'm not allowed to use approaches with RF legs. 
those are curved paths, like here in Reno, a bit like DME arcs, but part of some of the newer RNF GPS procedures. This limitation can possibly change with a future software revision for the IFD, and the new software would come with, you guessed it, a revised AFMS, which spells out what I can and cannot do then. Notice that the Garmin GTN already allows RF legs on approaches. Database updates are another good example. For IFR navigation, the IFD AFMS says a current database needs to be installed. Not an outdated one, not the next future one, but the current one. The GTN's AFMS allows pilots to verify each waypoint for accuracy manually if the installed database is not current. STCs for gross weight increase may come with some restrictions for flying when the airplane is loaded at that higher weight. Adding tip tanks will come with an AFMS that not just explains operations of the now more complex fuel system, but will also have some limitations for when to use which tank. And so on, and so on. There's a flip side, and that is that for all the other information in your POH or AFM, something that's not in the limitation section, you have some flexibility. For example, if the POH or your instructor suggests to reduce power to the famous 25 squared right after takeoff, and it's scary how many pilots and even CFI still believe that's the way to go, you are free to ignore that advice and climb with everything forward, as long as there's no limitation in the AFM or a supplement which says otherwise. If you want to create your own checklist and deviate from the ones printed in the AFM, you can do that unless your AFM limits you to the manufacturer's checklist. Just don't omit any required items. In fact, if you have modified your airplane over the years, it's probably necessary to customize your checklist so it accounts for the extra equipment. If you want to fly a lean of peak, even though your AFM does not have a performance table or recommended power settings for it, you can still do that legally, as long as there's no AFM limitation which prohibits it. Likewise, you can cruise at power settings other than what the AFM says. In fact, some AFMs include some really not so good recommendations for cruise power, resulting in good speed, but also in very high CHTs, and they're not very friendly to your engine in the long run. The bottom line is, don't treat your entire POH and AFM as the letter of the law. It isn't. Only the limitations section is to be treated like that. Of course, it goes without saying that you need to use these freedoms carefully. Don't do anything dangerous or reckless if you deviate from the AFM. But if you go about it carefully, you can change and improve a few things, all while complying with the limitations. Damn it. A good man always knows his limitations. And that is it for today. As I close, a quick shout out to Bruce Williams, who kindly provided some feedback and guidance for some of this material. Bruce has an excellent blog called Bruce Air, especially interesting for instrument pilots. Check it out sometime. Thank you also to Joe, Kevin, Bob, and Shalem, who have recently become patron supporters of my channel. I appreciate the help from all my patrons very much. Fly safe and see you soon in another video. Bye-bye.